Welcome to Around the Weird. Here's your host, the museum curator of the strange and unusual, Mr. Nothing. Thank you, mysterious voice, and welcome back to Around the Weird, a booktube channel where I talk about all the unusual and out of the ordinary literature that I have found in my travels. Today, I want to talk about a book that I read, uh, one that I picked up randomly from my local library. Don't forget to patronize your local libraries. I am referring to a book that is about Kenyan independence, so perhaps not as weird as some of the other books that I have selected. Um, yeah, I am referring to A Grain of Wheat by Ngugi Wa Thiongo. If I'm pronouncing that right. I did look up a pronunciation, so I'm hoping I'm right. Um, as you can see, the cover is, it seems pretty generic. It's just a, a group of people walking along a railroad, um, which the railroad does play a small part in this story. Um, I think it has some significance, or Theungo wants us to think it has some significance, um, but I guess I didn't get it on my first read through. So um, that's, the, I guess that's something to think about. So for those who don't know, Ngugi Wa Thiongo, uh is a writer who's been writing since the 1960s. And he uh, he's had something published as recently as 2019. Uh, he published a short story collection, uh, which I think I'd be interested in checking out because his writing is is pretty interesting there. Uh, Ngugi Wa Thiongo has written plays, short stories, uh, and books, much like this, often centering on the Kenyan revolution and what led up to it and uh, what happened afterwards as a result. Uh, and so uh, I, I had never heard of uh, Nugu uh, Thiongo um, before reading this, uh, which I find interesting because he's a somewhat controversial figure in, in, uh, in Kenya. Uh, he actually wrote a play. I don't remember what the play is called, but it was very critical of the elites in Kenya and even of the Kenyan government, specifically Jomo Kenyatta, who was the first president of Kenya and sort of seen as a, a liberator of the country from the United Kingdom uh, during the, uh, the emergency period uh, in the 1950s. Uh, yeah, so he criticized the government and he was eventually put in jail for a year, a little bit longer than that. Eventually, Amnesty International, uh, you know, adopted him as a sort of prisoner of conscience, uh, whatever that means. But it essentially means he was viewed as an exile in his own land. And so he's um, he spent some time away from Kenya. Um, what's interesting is that there's a message from uh, Chinwa Achebe in this um, in this story, at least the beginning, talking about the Penyan African Writers series. And it's interesting because uh, Chen, uh, Chinwa Achebe uh, was just as critical of his home, uh, which I'm failing to remember right now, I'll put it up somewhere right here, as um, uh, Thiongo was of, of Kenya. Uh, so um, so uh, something interesting, the, the connection there. Uh, but without further ado, let's talk about this um, this story. I'll do. I'll try to be a brief in my summary. I'll do an analysis, and we'll move on from there. So, a grain of wheat focuses on mainly a group of people in Kenya during the emergency period, during the turmoil and violence that existed within the period, a lot of flashbacks to the past, and in the present moment, like days and weeks before the the moment of independence finally comes and how people are coping with what ha what had happened before and how how joyous they are feeling about what is to come uh, the character that we mostly follow in this story is mugo a uh, a kenyan man who's who lives a solitary life he was in the detention centers when he was younger uh, and he gained a somewhat celebrity status because he refused to uh, to bend um, when, when they put pressure on him. Uh, he just never gave out anybody or gave up his oath of the of the Mau Mau, uh, tr um, which was the rebellion, rebellious forces that fought against the British during the Kenyan War for Independence. And so uh, he's gained a lot of celebrity 
uh, the military, specifically General R, uh, that's his name, no other, I don't know what the R stands for, but seeks him out and asks him to give a speech at the uh, Independence Day celebrations in this village that they're in. Uh, but he seems a little hesitant um, to, uh, to speak, and there seems to be something going on under the surface that we will probably find out about later. Uh, we also learn about uh, a character named Dr. John Thompson, uh, who is the who is the district office for this village area. Um, we learn that he's very prejudicial, very racist. His wife is cheating on him. He's a terrible human being. Uh, he views the Kenyans as savages and says that the United Kingdom needs to be here uh, to protect the Kenyans against themselves. Uh, and he at the by the end of the story, he's ready to he's on his way to leaving the United Kingdom because or leaving to go to the United Kingdom. Because because the the uh, he he doesn't know what what uh, what is there for him after the United Kingdom you know gives the Kenyans their independence is there going to be retribution against them he doesn't want to find out uh, we also find out about the characters of Gikonyo Kihika and Karanha. Gikonyo and Karanha are both, uh, uh, they're childhood friends, but they're, they're both pursuing the same woman uh, in uh, during the uh, the revolution her name is Mumby. Uh, they they both like her, but Mumby ultimately chooses Gikonyo. Uh, however, um, Gikonyo and Karanha um, are 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 in trouble with the uh, the British sort of home guard. Um, they end up arresting Gikonyo for uh, uh, because they believe that he is with the Mau Mau rebellion, uh, and they put him in a detention center. Uh, and when Gikonyo comes back, um, he finds out that uh, Mumby has actually had a child with Karanha, even though Mumbi um, points out that she only did this as a way of, uh, of giving uh, or getting Karanya to eventually free Gikonyo, which he does. Uh, but um, throughout the rest of the story, Gikonyo is, is, puts um, Mumbi at a distance because that child isn't really his, and he feels deeply saddened and betrayed by what Mumbi did, um, even if uh, maybe he, he begins to understand at, the, at a later point in the story why she might have done it. Um, we all, we, again, we also learn about Kihika in this story, who is another legendary figure who ran off into the forest area to join the Mau Mau uh, people. And uh, uh, the military forces were looking for him, uh, but uh, they, they weren't able to. Um, however, he was eventually discovered hanged in the forest, and nobody knows exactly who did it or who sold him out or why. And that's sort of uh, what's going on throughout the entire story. General R approaches Mugo again and tells him basically to give a speech where he talks about whoever killed Kahika should um, should walk forward. And essentially, they're going to try to blame Karanha because it really seems like he had something to gain from selling out Kahika, um, especially as he was made uh, he was put in a position of power uh, that that seems to only grow once the British finally leave. Uh, but Mugo is again resistant. And th this only adds to his legend because he's seen as a humble man. Like, not only did he resist the British forces and, uh, when he was in the deten detention center, but he also um, uh, it refuses to, to, you know, give in to power and, and take it when he, when he, when he would w much rather be for the people. Um, but we eventually, Mugo is talking to Mumbi. And we learn that uh, Kihika actually approached Mugo, like he snuck into the village one day and uh, started talking, telling Mugo, like Mugo has to join the resistance forces. Every able-bodied man should do that, or otherwise they're they're essentially betraying the the promise of Kenyan independence. And Mugo didn't really want to join because either either way he's going to go back to the detention center. He doesn't want to serve time and and put himself in any danger. And so what he does is he goes to the district officer, who turns out to be Dr. Thompson at the time, and says that he's willing to turn Kahika in for the monetary reward that comes with it. Uh, and but the, immediately after telling them where Kahika is, he feels this immense guilt and, and realizes that he's made a grave mistake. 
Uh, and so the only person he's told about this so far is Mumby, and she's kind of aghast about that. It's kind of a, a terrifying and um, terrible ordeal because he feels this immense guilt, and it's also something that's clearly bad about this character that we've been following. Um, a few days later, the Independence Day celebration happens, um, and finally, um, General R gets up and gives the speech in Mugo's place, where he's just about to call out Karanha. However, Mugo shows up and says, I'm the one who did it. You should be, uh, you should be looking at me. And everyone is just shocked. And a little, some people are even angry and, and point out, like, I can't believe you did that. You're an imposter, Mugo. And Mugo goes back to his, um, his hut um, and his house, essentially. And uh, uh, he waits a, few, uh, a, a day or two. And then finally, the general shows up and says, it's time for you to serve your trial. Every man must be held accountable for what he did. And Mugo is ready at this point. He is ready to accept uh, his responsibility for this death and uh, be held accountable. So that's that's pretty great on his part. Um, and then... Um, Gikanyo, who during the Independence Day celebration, like he broke his arm, he's in the hospital, and Mumbi shows up and um, she indicates that she wants to, you know, rekindle the relationship. Um, and so does Gikanyo. Um, like he seems ready to just forget everything in the past, but both Mumbi and him kind of acknowledge that there needs to be a conversation had first about what's been going on over the course of the story. Especially because Gikanyo pretty much hit Mumbi, and everyone was like, "How dare you hit this girl? You're 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 poisonous. Stop being poisonous to, to everyone you touch." And so, as the story ends, they they there's a little bit of hope for their relationship, but there's also some uncertainty about what's going to happen after the revolution. Now that uh, it seems like you know some not everything went to plan. In terms of analysis, there is a lot to talk about with this very interesting story. Uh, one thing that uh, I feel uh, Nugugi Watiango does really well is talking about the reality of revolution. We have these stories in our head about how uh, we, we sort of mythologize revolution. We do it here in America. We turn Thomas Jefferson and John Adams and George Washington and, and Alexander Hamilton into mythological figures who fought for America and made uh, and got its independence and everything was hunky dory and great. Um, but when we when we talk about these stories, we have a tendency to focus on the elites rather than the common people. Uh, in this case, the elites would be Jomo Kenyatta. And you hear that happening in this story. Like, these people tend to focus on what Kenyan revolution means, and they immediately start talking about Jomo, and how he's been arrested, and he'll probably be out soon, and he'll, he'll lead everyone into, um, into, into the Kenyan independence. Uh, and so what Thiongo does in this story is something really fascinating, is focusing on these, these common people, the reality of revolution, and how it's not always easy for the people in the thick of it. They have their own lives going on. They have to make a lot of sacrifices, and there's this sense of betrayal, as Mugo does to Kihika, because Mugo doesn't want this this added burden of, of having to join a a um, join the the resistance because of what it could mean. How he could be thrown into detention center and beaten and possibly killed by the British. Like that that would not be um, a lot of fun. And how uh, a lot of the men and, and a lot of the women in this village that uh, where the story takes place have had to sacrifice a great deal in their life in order to uh, be um, be at, uh, in order to be uh, ready in the mental mindset of revolution, uh, whether it be sacrificing a family or having to live with with less or something like that. There's a lot of that going on in this story, and I and it's it's kind of it, it makes uh, like seeing all this betrayal and the sacrifice going on. It makes the revolution seem ugly, and that's just like what it is. When you when you have a revolution, you should not paint it as something super clean. And and although it might be morally justified or or justified in some sense of the word, like at the, at the end of it, there's still all of this going on that makes hands unclean. Like there's a lot of blood on on people's hands. Um, more so than anything on Dr. Thompson's hands, who who had people beaten to death and starved people and tortured people. Um, I, I think it's it's obvious that Theungo is trying to paint him as a as a real bad guy, but also maybe trying to humanize him too. And I don't get that because he's he's pretty racist and like there's no real redeeming qualities to him. 
Uh, but yeah, it's, it's very interesting how Thiongo writes this all. Uh, one thing that I really like is um, how he how he touches upon the promises of the new Kenya, how uh, Jomo Kenyatta and others have been promising that the people of Kenya will be liberated and things are they're in for a better day because they're no longer being held back by the white people, uh, by, by the white man, essentially. But there are some doubts seeping in by the end of the story. Allow me to read you a quote from this. Kathima had not in fact changed much. The exclusive white settlement seemed to have grown bigger instead. Why was she still in Kenya? Why were all these whites still in Kenya despite the ringing of Uhuru bells? Would Uhuru really change things for the likes of him in General R? Doubt stabbed him. And th that, that, that question rings. Like, everything, not everything is completely changing in Kenya. The whites are still there. Like, uh, they're still going to be in this village after independence ends. There's still going to be these elites like Jomo Kenyatta out there. So is, is the, can the promise of the new Kenya be met? If, if Thiongo's later writing um, is to be believed, he's, he's arguing that this is, the doubt is already seeping in, that um, the people in the village, the low, lower class individuals, um, they probably won't have their lives improved by this revolution. Uh, you can see that that was actually the case in, in real life because uh, Jomo Kenyatta's uh, administration was subject to accusations of corruption and and bribery and, and all those sorts of things. And even his child, like uh, the current president of Kenya, um, he like he his uh, administration has been accused of that as well. So as time has gone on, it, it really seems like the, these low people, these, these farmers, these peasants, are no better off than they were under the British regime. Uh, so for many, the promise of, of a new Kenya, of, of liberation, of freedom, kind of wasn't met. Another interesting thing about this story is how Thiongo infuses uh, religion into this story. Uh, there's biblical references throughout this story, specifically referencing Moses and Exodus, uh, which, if you recall, is a story of essentially Jewish liberation uh, from, from Egypt. Uh, this is all really interesting because, if you recall, the, the first people to visit Kenyans were really missionaries. Uh, they showed up and were like, hey, have you considered Christianity or Catholicism or whatnot? And then they, they, um, they converted some people and then they started oppressing those people um, by you know, offering some people power, by, uh, by having it so after the missionaries come in, you start getting the British government, essentially using this religion in some way to oppress um, uh, the native Kenyans, uh, which is exactly what you saw in Indian Horse, uh, if you recall my video there, where like the, um, the in the boarding schools, the, 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 the Catholic church, the, the church in general, um, used this religion as a way to oppress the, the native Indians. And that's what you see happening in this story. But something happened that didn't happen in Indian horse, and that is that the um, the Kenyans began to adopt uh, Christianity or some mixture of their of their uh, their their native myths and Christianity, and they began to use it in a way that uh, that used the language of freedom of liberation against their oppressor. You saw that happen with Martin Luther King Jr. and the 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 Black Civil Rights Rights Movement in the 1960s. How uh, these civil rights leaders began to talk about a promised land and a freedom and a new day arriving uh, where all men were created equal under God and, and whatnot. And um, the, so that you see that 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 the language of their oppressor of of basically of, of Christianity being used to uh, to further the the American civil rights movement, but in here being used to further the idea that independence is is come is long come like it's it's arriving soon. God will usher it in, and and um, God wants us all to be free and independent, so we cannot abide by the British lead. And so that's a long term implication of all this is that. Eventually, like, um, like, if you bring in religion, eventually someone's going to use that religion to justify their own freedom down the road. Um, but the the other thing about this is is that ultimately this does prove that the British or the oppressors won because you got the Kenyans to abandon their their myths and their savage ways in order to adopt these more civilized religions such as Christianity or Catholicism. 
So in a way, maybe uh, Thiongo is kind of arguing that the British um, changed Kenya possibly for the worse, um, although I might be reaching for that point there. Another thing I like about this story is the characterization. I really like how uh, Ngugi wa Thiongo writes Mugo and Gikonyo and Mumbi. These are all very real characters, um, at least in my eyes. And although they are fictional, like they they add to the overall story. Like Thiongo could have written about someone like Jomo Kenyatta, but it's it's very important to to focus on Mugo. And, and Mumbi and, and those smaller people. And by creating these, these fictional sort of avatars to illustrate his point about uh, the, the sort of failed promises and, and the suffering that was necessary to get to that point of Kenyan independence, like in the process, he creates great characters and that, that you really want to see thrive or succeed in some way. Like when Mugo was arrested, when, when, he, when he admitted to killing someone who was essentially one of his best friends, like that was hard and like I wanted to see him get better from that point. And unfortunately, I don't think that happened. That's not how the story that's not how the story ends. But these are still wonderfully written characters. And like uh, related to that is like they're great writing. Like uh uh Diango has a way of drawing you into the story using mythology and using these characters. So I got to give Diango credit there for for that work. However, I will say the writing is also sexist at times. The way he views women in Kenyan society seems to be kind of sexist um i don't want to say you know it, it's sexist because this is it feels like i'm criticizing the culture but at the same time i have to call it like i see it and this is pretty sexist how like mumbi is essentially written as sort of like a in like a trophy to to fight over for for these two women and some of the other things he says about women is is kind of is kind of sketchy um i'll also say the first half of this book is is kind of slow it's not bad i just would have preferred uh for him to you know arrive at his point a little bit faster because it takes so long to set set up the story it feels like nothing really happens in the first half so you know that's that, that's a minor gripe but uh i still feel, feel it's pretty valid and it might discourage you from reading this if um, if you were hoping for something with maybe a little more substance in the first half Anyway, so those are my thoughts on A Grain of Wheat by Nagugi Wathiango, a very fascinating book, and uh, it's something that you can you can say this is something that eventually got uh, Nagugi imprisoned. It's it's very interesting to see how like the the formation of of the, of the sort of like case that people were building against him like look at all of his controversial literature he's criticizing us um although they didn't say that they wanted to seem like he was you know um his writing was just bad for the people when in reality it was bad for the for the government uh but it, it's very fascinating to to get this view into kenyan culture especially because i have i don't think i've read a, a book by a kenyan author before so i definitely recommend uh i recommend this book even though it's a bit slow uh, at times, uh, I do think you would get um, a lot out of it. Um, you, it, it would help. It would help everyone see a little bit different about the world. And um, you know, it's always good to read about how corrupt leaders might not be in the best interest for you know the peasants, like like Mumbi and uh, Mugo at times. So uh, definitely recommend this if you haven't read it before. If you've read this before or you simply want to comment on something I said, feel free to comment below. Let's have a discussion about a grain of wheat. Otherwise, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe so that more people can find out about Nugugi Wathiongo. And until then, I wish you the best of luck in your weird and peasanty travels. Farewell.